Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending today's special webinar on data harmonization strategies. I'm Kelly Pickerel, editor with Solar Power World, and we have a very exciting roundtable today. But before we get started, just want to let you know of a few housekeeping items. So throughout today's discussion, you can submit your own questions to the presenters. Please send those questions in the Q&A window on your screen. And this webinar will be sent to all registrants so you can view it again at your convenience. So today we have a great group of people to discuss the keys to scaling up solar projects and mitigating financial risks. Today we'll be hearing from Jan Rippengale, who is co-founder and CEO of Blue Banyan, Cliff Hansen, who is in R&D and mathematics for Sandia National Lab, Jeffrey Cook, who is in renewable energy policy and market analysis with NREL, Tom Tanzi, who is chairman of the SunSpec Alliance, Scott Wen, who is co-founder and CEO of Bodhi, and Dixon Wright, who is senior VP of the surety team for USI Insurance Services. So we have a lot to hear today, so I'm going to pass things off now to Jan at Blue Banyan. Thank you very much, Kelly. I appreciate it. We have a lot to talk about today, and we will be talking with the it, leaders in the data standardization movement in the solar industry. This has been a project and a process that has been going on for over seven years and is finally coming to fruition, developing the momentum that we need and demonstrating that we really can scale up solar projects in such a way that they execute more quickly, we address and we're able to mitigate the financial risks so that we can expand to meet the demands that we have as a collective on decarbonizing the grid so that we can move forward and leave a world that works for our children. So today's opportunity, we're really going to discuss the business opportunity that's available to you and what you need to do to take full advantage of that. So these are the different um, people that we're going to be speaking to, and we'll we'll touch base with each of them as they go through with their areas. So we will discuss each of these guys in turn, but we have a list of power players here. So to give a little context about where it is that we are right now, all of the solar that has been installed to date only constitutes 3% of the nation's electricity. By 2035, it needs to be 40% of the nation's electricity. So we need to increase what we're doing dramatically. And if we break that down, it means that we need to be installing 30 gigawatts of solar every year on average between now and 2025. And then it needs to be 60 gigawatts on average between 2025 and 2030. So we need to be doubling the amount of solar power that we're installing every year. So to put this in perspective, in 2019, collectively, we installed 13.5 gigawatts of solar. And in 2020, it was 19.2. So we are starting 2021 slightly behind, and we need to grow up to have that average of 30 gigawatts by 2025. So the business opportunity for being able to double every single year is hypergrowth, 50% a year. In software, is considered hypergrowth. So 100% a year is unprecedented levels of hypergrowth. And what do we need to do to actually meet that demand? If you think for a second about how much data that we already have, how many Excel spreadsheets that we've got out there, and thousands and thousands of every single project's home and the data for the site survey and the install and the photos for every single piece that goes along with any solar installation. And you multiply that by doubling every year for the next 10 years, that's 1,023 times the amount of data points that you're gonna to need to be able to manage. And that cannot be done in disparate systems where everybody's got their own method because it's 
because it's just absolutely overwhelming. Also, the people that it requires when you've got everything like that custom, you only works with master electricians. We need to have stuff that's more plug and play and that can happen much more quickly. So the amount of data that we're talking about here is just staggering. And in, we're going to have to solve that problem in order to move forward. The upside of this State of the Union is that we have a generational opportunity. The energy industry and the energy industry information management can be changed in such a way that it sets up the strong foundation for everything that we do going forward. If you think back to oil and gas, they had 80, 90 years to set up their infrastructure, and they did it starting in the 19th century where turn of the century, they didn't even have computers. It wasn't even a part of the thought process. And we are going to be accomplishing the same mission in 20 to 30 years, so about the third the time, at a much higher demand level because we consume electricity at a much higher rate than we did at the turn of the, cent of the 19th century. And we are going to, so we're going to be doing what has never been done before with the electrical information grid. It is going to be awesome, but it does require a coordinated standardized approach in order to succeed. So why aren't we here already? Why hasn't this already happened? There are five main reasons. The first is high soft costs. It costs 66% to run the business between permitting, supply chain, sales and marketing, general administration. We have to get this down 30% and just reduce the cost of solar. The second reason is we've got financing and tax credits. The tax credits have absolutely reduced the costs, but we're still, our total addressable market is still only for households that have above $90,000 dollars in them. The reality is we need to bring that down so our total addressable market becomes larger. That is where we're going to get the more solar projects for the demand that we need. And in order to fund that, we need to be able to consistently show that we are appropriately addressing the risks involved so we can get private financing coming in and replacing that government financing, especially for the people where they can't take advantage of it. The next impediment has been this fragmented regulated, re regulatory environment. I defy anyone to be able to get, whether you're in the city of Houston or Harris County, correct, seven out of 10 times, much less 10 out of 10 times. It is hard and it has been hard. So we need to establish new tools to get through this quagmire and Unfortunately, yep, they're coming. The next problem has been data silos and a lack of integration. We have hodgepodge collectively all these different systems together and been very creative about how are we wired all up. However, we need to establish a consistent plug. So just like when you, you know, take an electrical device and you plug it into the wall socket, you're expecting it to operate on 110 volts we need to be able to plug in all of our software and expect to exchange site object data for our project data back and forth so that it's smooth, easy, and doesn't require a master electrician to run a toaster, for instance. And this is where the data standardization and harmonization really can start to sing as we get the standards. Right now, everything is very difficult to connect, you have to have a lot of expertise to bring everyone onto the same page. But in the standardized and harmonized data solution, it can be plug and play so that we can all move fast. So these have been why the five reasons why we haven't been able to proceed and what it's gonna take for us to move forward is the, utilizing all of these tools. So the Department of Energy has the orange button data standard and it has been there for quite some time. We made a critical pivot in 2021 where we shifted from XBRL technology to JSON technology, which is what is used much more frequently on the internet. 
which enabled us to move from needing master developers to needing like regularly trained developers. And that has created a cascade of software companies who are able to utilize the technology. It has been fabulous. And we're going to share more about that. We've got solar app, which is going to be talked about in depth with Dr. Jeff Cook. And he's the, with what we're doing for the AHJs, as well as the permitting systems and getting those regulations under, under control. Finally, we've got solar success, integrating all these apps to a single source of truth. And then we're taking it next level, util utilizing Celigo and other integration platforms like that. So you can have no code. Clicks not code is all you need to begin these integrations. So we've had the impediments and we're moving to the next side, to the next side of this story. So what exactly is data harmonization? Fundamentally, we need to be talking apples to apples consistently just like you needed standards to build a house. So you, when you plug in an elect, you know, your toaster or any electrical device, you know that you're gonna get 110 volts. We need to be able to have these standards where we know we're gonna get site information about that project in a consistent way. And it sounds kind of simple and kind of obvious, but let's think about what happens right now. Every company just kind of makes up you know, has been making up their APIs. And one of them, you know, started off as residential solar and they put all of their metrics into kilowatts. And that's really great for residential solar, but let's say that they want to use the same tool for a utility scale, scale solar and they start doing it in megawatts. How do they know which one they're actually talking about as they move forward? Maybe we're going to go the other direction and do an internet of things and start operating in watts. We can't be making assumptions anymore about what it is that the data that we're talking about. We need to be explicit every time in the same way. And that way we can just look at a data set and know what it means without needing to guess or have tribal knowledge in order to understand. So harmonizing this data breaks barriers to capital allocation because we're able to prove to the financiers that we don't have risky projects. They can look at the same data that we're looking at, evaluate it in the same way we're evaluating it, and come to the same conclusion that the risk has been addressed and everything is okay. The scalability that comes from this level of clarity, where you're not dealing with everything, you're only dealing with the problems or the exceptions, is key to utilizing our human resources as we grow this quickly and the expertise that we have. So rapid deployment of renewables, we have to be saving time, reducing errors and lowering costs and harmonizing data is the biggest and fastest way that we can do this collectively to maximize our ability to take advantage of this unprecedented business opportunity. So Dr. Cliff Hansen works with Sandia National Laboratories with PV Watts and has been absolutely connected from the beginning as a founding member of the Orange Button Initiative. And he's gonna to talk to us more about what exactly is a solar taxonomy and why do we need this? Thank you, Jan. My name is Cliff Hansen. I'm pleased to meet you all virtually. And I'm also pleased today to talk with you about the, the Orange Button Taxonomy which we think is a major technology component for realizing data harmonization. The taxonomy is open source, public, and free to use. We chose to implement using JSON to comply with an open API 3.0 specification and to use style conventions consistent with JavaScript coding. We think that these choices will make adoption easy. You can find the taxonomy on GitHub, and you can find an editor on Sunspec's website at the link shown, which makes it easy to browse this taxonomy and to search the underlying terms. The so taxonomy Cliff, provides, go ahead, Jim. Oh, so, so can anyone sign up to be a contributor to the taxonomy? It's open source. We welcome community contributions. Um, open source means that you can't sign up anonymously. I believe you can comment, but you have to uh, identify yourself in order to submit contributions. 
Great. Right. So a taxonomy fundamentally provides a dictionary of terms and keywords. This diagram is showing conceptually one way that the taxonomy can be used. A data center software can import the taxonomy, which is just one underlying JSON file. Use the terms found in that file to encode data and prepare the data to transmit to someone else. The receiver software also imports the same taxonomy and so can interpret the data it receives in the same meaning as the sender. In essence, this taxonomy is providing a consistent basis to enable uh, information data exchange between any two applications. Great. So, yeah, can you tell us more about what that actually means? Well, I could show you an example, and maybe this will help it make it concrete. Um, we selected here one term in the taxonomy to show you. Uh, the term is called energy AC. Uh, in the editor, you can also view a definition, which is a you know human form sentence describing what this taxonomy, what, what this element uh, is meant to represent, and some other information about the term itself. Each taxonomy has a set of primitives that are going to communicate uh, its value and some metadata about that value. I'll talk about those primitives on the next chart. In this example term I chose because it illustrates how the same term can be used in different contexts. And by doing so, we're going to make the terms themselves reusable. Um, so Cliff, does this affect what you're doing with PV Watts? It does. PV Watts is one uh, piece of software that does energy prediction. You input a weather file and some system descriptions and it gives you back a quantity of electricity that that system's predicted to produce. Um, that quantity would be could be communicated using this energy AC term. The context that that, um, you know, say it's 12 kilowatt hours, that that 12 kilowatt hours is a prediction is represented by the object uh, that you communicate with the term. It's in the energy prediction space. And so that tells you that this is a prediction of energy. Contrasted with the right-hand part of the chart, which says that if I'm observing a PV system that's already been built, I can record how much energy was actually produced. Uh, and that's communicated by using the energy AC term in a different context in energy measurements. It looks to me like this could be really useful for developers who are doing their custom models for predictions, but they do that. Can they close the loops right now with their energy production? And wouldn't this well, make it easier the, to close yeah, those Yeah, the operations and maintenance community would also do that. Close, and we've been involved in some pretty detailed conversations with that community over the last year or two to understand their use cases and their uh, needs for uh, common data exchange. An O&M provider may get records of an energy prediction before the system was built and then be asked by their customer after the system's in operation to compare the actual operation with those predictions to see if it's performing as promised. Um, by using a common dictionary of terms in this way, and um, sorry, I hit the wrong button there, um, that O&M provider it would enable their software to automate the processing of these comparisons. Um, many of them are operating on spreadsheets and other kinds of databases, and they have a staff member that goes through every month, and it's a laborious task to line up the, the pairs of columns and to calculate um, system performance ratios. What would it look like in the new world? In the new world, you could program against these terms and have the software automate that matching and comparison and, and essentially your uh, you take the, the labor hours out of computing the results and you can invest those in explaining the results to your customers. Do you have any examples of what that data might look like? I do. Um, let me talk first about the primitives, which um, are common to all the elements in the taxonomy and are used to actually communicate the value. So you think about energy AC, it's, it's kind of like a section heading and then the contents of that section are a number, which is the value. Uh, terms that are communicating numbers can be assigned units and should be. They can be assigned a uh, duration of time or a time interval. And if desired, some estimate of precision 
or a number of uh, significant decimal places, just often necessary for currency related items. Um, this simple pattern of primitives can be used to describe every data element in the taxonomy, although in many cases, they're not all necessary. For example, there is a taxonomy element named uh, contact name. Its value is only a string and there's no real reason to assign a unit or other things to it. As an illustration of what that looks like once it's encoded, this is not uh, a segment from a JSON file. Those are not human friendly to read. So we arranged it this way. Uh, the field name, the value, the units could be, um, there, there's a, a selection of units available that could be assigned to this. Start and end times in a standard format. That looks really great. It makes it absolutely clear what you're talking about just by looking at the data. You don't need to know more context about where it came from. Yep. So I'll, I'll just summarize real quick. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the development funding that was provided by DOE Solar Energy Technology Office. Um, that funding sustained us through the creation period. Uh, we do have the uh, the open API taxonomy out there published on GitHub. Um, I would, it's, it's by no means mature, but it is ready to be used and ready to be developed in an open source model. Uh, the future development is going to be prioritized by market demands and realized by uh, contributions from interested community and adopters. And your help is welcome. The exclamation point is attended, uh, intentional there. Um, and I look forward to seeing you in that space. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff. This is very exciting. Great to see how this has come together to support the industry. Dr. Jeffrey Cook is going to tell us more about how Solar App is working and how it's helping installers get more done faster, which directly impacts those soft costs and reduce, reduces the overall project cost. So Jeff, would you like to tell awesome. us about Solar App? What yeah. is it exactly? I'll jump into it, and thanks so much, everyone, for joining us today. Um, in short, the Solar app is the Solar Automated Permit Processing Plus. Um, what it does is it delivers instant plan review on eligible rooftop residential solar projects, um, and we're more recently moving to incorporate solar and storage projects, again, in the residential context into the application. Uh, the development of the application was um, U.S. Department of Energy National Renewable Energy Lab, of course, which I am a part, and the Department of Energy, of course, funded it from the Solar Energy Technologies Office largely. But developing this project has been a collaborative effort with a, lot, a variety of code agencies, uh, local governments, contracting or contractors, the solar industry, um, and then, of course, permitting software vendors in the AHJ permitting space, authority having jurisdiction or local governments. You'll hear me use those terms interchangeably. Ultimately, all so, these groups came together to deliver. Oh, that is awesome. I see that you've got the Orange Button logo in there. How are you guys using Orange Button? Yeah, so we use Orange Button in the AHJ registry, that um, really nice uh, document or figure you did before, Jan, uh, with the Houston uh, AHJ boundaries and Particular, we use that to validate um, that a project is actually within the jurisdiction for which they're permitting the application. And of course, there's a variety of other, um, that's just a starting point for where Orange Button and Solar App um, are going to be coordinating going forward. Of course, in developing uh, databases and resources around equipment uh, to be able to verify that it can all be used in combination with each other and, of course, then be permitted in the jurisdiction question. So there's actually a lot of uh, ways we're going to be working together going forward. Well, that is exciting to hear and about. That's just, and that's just one of the examples of our collaborative efforts here. Um, in part, a lot of the work uh, initially was around taking the model codes, which the solar app is based on. That's the 2017 National Electrical Code, the 2018 International Building Codes and International Residential Codes to be able to develop the solar app. And now our collaborative act activities are moving to expand to new technologies as well as um, incorporating um, better and more efficient use cases of streamlining the process, which can be through uh, API automated communications, et cetera. 
Uh, but ultimately, so far, the solar app is already in use. It's a real product. It's delivered over 2,000 uh, approved projects across 10 jurisdictions and now 11 um, jurisdictions that are permitting uh, or using this, the application to permit their, their solar projects. And there are over 170 other jurisdictions across the country that are working with solar app and are in some uh, adoption. Ultimately, as I mentioned, solar app automates the plan review process. So we've taken permit review times from as many as 20 business days in Tucson. Arizona is now adopting communities to less than one day instant approvals, um, which is really exciting. That's um, while contractors are getting faster permit reviews, jurisdictions have saved over 2000 hours of staff time reviewing initial permits and then subsequent revisions. About 20% of the projects in Solar App Plus get revised at least once. And so jurisdictions would have had to have reviewed those after the first go around. Um, and so they've saved all that time. We haven't negatively impacted inspection rates. And so they're still passing at about the same rate they did before. The hope is that we'll actually improve rates by maybe 20, 25% when uh, both contractors and inspectors get more up to speed with the checklist that we provide. And then last but not least, and probably most importantly, is projects are getting installed 12 days faster, um, and they're getting through final inspection as well 12 days faster than projects that don't go through solar app. So the homeowner is also getting their projects commissioned faster um, as a result of using solar apps. So this figure has all of our five pilot partners, and you can see the green bar is what's most interesting there. So when you compare to all the um, average installation times for residential solar in all the communities from 2019 to 2021, the solar app projects are getting installed in some time, in some cases much faster uh, than is the case elsewhere. Um, and so that's really exciting to see. Of course, we're still tracking piloting and adoption related successes at the solar app. Um, if you're interested to get in partnership or collaborate with us, encourage you to go to the website where you can sign up for the newsletter you can reach out to us uh, to get part to participate in the development of new features you can also see what jurisdictions are already using the software and where we're going um, from here so we encourage you all uh, to reach out so, to so by reduce that's this is really fabulous Jeff can just to pull this all together by reducing that 12 days, that means that the solar installers are getting cash faster in the door because they're able to get their permits more quickly so they can get the installation, which is where they get the bulk of their cash, right? Which would be what is necessary to fund, you know, a growing company, right? Exactly. So it really just speaks to that win-win-win that the solar app provides. So. The contractor does pay $25 per uh, approved system that goes through solar app. In some jurisdictions, that is offset with a removal of plan review fees, but that's only in Tucson and Pima at current. Um, so now far, they are paying that price premium. But the value of that is you get the certainty of an instant permit. You also, according to this, can install All, as I said, about two weeks faster, which puts money uh, in their pockets, uh, the homeowner's pocket, and then also saves the jurisdiction time as well. Right. So it's a better customer experience as well. So I love how this all works together. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing, coordinating so many different players to pull all of this together um, is an incredible task. And we are so glad that you're here today to share your learning about what has made it work. Yeah, happy to be here. So Scott Wen is our next kind of presenter who is going to talk about how leveraging this same kind of data standard to improve customer engagement and the customer experience um, has helped. And Scott, how, how are you working with Orange Button 
the date and tell me what exactly is Bodhi and what are you doing? Yeah, so let me just give you a, just kind of a briefing overview of Bodhi. So we're a software tool, and what we like to say is we help the residential solar companies just deliver amazing customer experiences, but while also improving their operations about 25 to 50 percent, and um, increasing referrals about 30 percent. Um, one of the key things, the way that we do this, is by integrating across the solar companies' operational tools, and it's actually really hard because when you start to think about, hey. You know, solar is a consumer product, so now you have to interface with the customer. And just like um, in the previous talk, of you know, the amount that you can actually be able to engage and give customers the information, they're just going to be happier. So I went solar myself. I know about that process that it takes three months, five months, six, 12 months to go from signing a contract to finally powering the system on. And so getting that type of engagement making it easier and more seamless is just going to get more people happier about going solar, which in which point they'll tell their friends and family members to go to. And so that's where you get that network effect. And that's how the whole industry is going to scale. But just kind of um, give you a sense so, of how so hard did, it is. Oh mm -hmm. yeah. What were the complexities that you had to overcome in order to be able to do this? <clears throat> yeah, because if you think about it, you know, from a customer standpoint, the year, the solar company is the company is the solar company there's a lot of different steps a lot of different stakeholders and so but your company is the one that they're paying and you are the face of that of, of their solar experience but then when you start thinking about that like why is it so hard well you know these solar companies you know they're really good at selling solar they're really good at um, installing solar but delivering that digital experience that their customers now expect that's really hard because there's two, and that's twofold. One is because it's just a new customer segment. You know, the industry has moved from the early adopters now into the mass consumer. And this mass consumer, they're being, they're being conditioned by their experiences with like Uber or with Amazon. And so they've got very high expectations. And so as a solar company, as a solar installer, you're thinking, what tools do I have? And so I've got a CRM, I've got a project management documents, field apps, monitoring, all these different disparate sources of information that sometimes talk together, sometimes don't. Do the fields always align? And so how, for a customer, how do they get the seamless experience with information that is always accurate and without any sort of hesitation in that information? And so when we started with Bodhi, we had to integrate across all these different tools. And many times the fields and the values didn't talk to each other, wasn't a, a, a source of truth. And so we um, we were able to do it and we're still able to do it now. But when you start looking at, for example, solar success, this is when you tie in the CRM, the project management, the documents and other components together, the ERP. And so that in itself helps to bring some um, efficiencies to this process. And then further, once we start looking at um, this next step of incorporating orange button and then with integration platforms like Sligo, that takes it this integration of all these different disparate sources to this next level to make it a lot easier to, to handle. And then from there to deliver a good customer experience. So Scott, as the industry scales more to take advantage of this opportunity and 100% year over year growth, as we bring those costs down so our total addressable market goes from the $90,000 a year households and lower, how do you think that's going to affect the customer expectations of their engagement yeah. experience? <clears throat> so that means that you're going to get a different customer segment. You'll probably get a younger customer segment too. And as I said, these customers, these are the mass consumers that are being fashioned by you know Netflix and, and Amazon. And so for example, if you order food or order a pizza, you know exactly when that pizza actually goes into the oven. But you buy a $30,000 solar, solar system, what's the status of my solar project? That's this million dollar question that for the industry to solve. And so that's where getting having the right information is so key and then having the right way to interface with these consumers is important. And so that's where Bodhi comes in and that's where all the effort with the orange button, with solar success, that starts to tie in together so that we are able to to meet those really high expectations, the high demands of the what we like to call the new energy consumer. I I love that the new energy consumer, and their high demands for having consistent data, 
which is exactly what the financing companies are demanding in order to know what their risk is. So we can no, solve yeah. the same problem with it. We can solve multiple problems with the same solution. Yeah, I think that's true. And the financing companies are really important because with them, you know, when you start going solar and consumer goes solar, it's not the relationship just doesn't end there at the point of install. These folks, they want more information, more energy, more awareness, more control. And so solar ends up being this gateway to more energy products. So these customers are going to want batteries, EVs, EV chargers. And so the financing companies, all of them have home improvement or other departments, including their service, their, their solar financing. They're going to want to sell these op these extra loans and products and services also. So this is the benefit of trying to deliver a really good experience, developing that deep relationship, because the fact is there's a 25 year customer relationship that just comes inherent in solar and you're just gonna be left out in the dust if you don't develop that relationship and then be able to leverage that into uh, realizing the lifetime customer value of your hard earned customers. So it, thank you, Scott. And it's clear that there's a whole lot of data that is involved in doing this. How do you pass so much data in one place? Do you have an example so, of what that might look like? So yeah, if you look over here, and this is our, this is kind of the, this is the integration that we have with Solar Success and through um, using the orange button um, standardization. So all the customer information is in here, all the project information. So if you want to start to communicate with your customer and really personalize the experience, not just you know, not just giving them a PDF, but go and say, hi, you know, hi, Jan, we are, and then now say, hey, we've just made an order for all your materials. Here's this list. You've got 22 LG panels. You've got an Enphase IQA inverter. Being able to personalize all that experience for them, that's when you're going to reassure and that customer who's currently really anxious about a $30,000 system that's taking several weeks to months to actually install. So those are the ways and the techniques that if you're able to personalize the experience, that then results back to your operations team is huge efficiency because they won't have to make that phone call asking the simple question, what's the status of my project? Oh, I love it. This is really great. Thank you so much, Scott. I am yeah, thanks. really excited to see this coming all the way down to the to the ground level where the homeowners are experiencing the benefits. And our next speaker, Tom Tanzi, is probably known by everyone as the chairman of the SunSpec Alliance and has been working on standardization and orange button from the beginning. So Tom, tell us more about SunSpec and what you've been doing and how it affects or what we've got what we're doing today for the data standardization and how we're going to enable the solar ecosystem to take advantage of this opportunity. If only I were as popular as, as what you're describing. Well, boy, what a world that would be. But thank you, Jan, I appreciate all those kind words. And so, hi everyone, my name's Tom Tanzi and I am the chairman and acting executive director for the SenseBec Alliance. Uh, this is an organization that uh, I helped found about a dozen years ago. And uh, we are a trade alliance, and we have a very singular mission, which is to uh, develop and then deploy information standards for distributed energy. Uh, we haven't changed that mission from the, from the day we started. Uh, the, the job has gotten bigger, it's gone in directions that we never could have anticipated, but we're, we're staying true to, to, to that mission. Uh, we just signed our 150th member uh, to our organization and membership participation, of course, is key to the way that we do our business where members come together, they uh, d develop these types of standards and Orange Button was, was one of them. Uh, we sought funding from the US Department of Energy and was mentioned that they provide a significant amount of $4 million of initial cash. Uh, but although I do uh, wanna add that uh, industry contributed more than four million of in-kind contributions. So uh, this is really equal parts uh, government funding, but also a grassroots participation that allows uh, SunSpec to develop its its standards, of which Orange Button is one. I, during this past year, 
our flagship standard, something called SunSpec Modbus, uh, was written into IEEE 1547. And so sorry for all the numbers and letters, but that is the core standard that governs all distributed energy in the United States and Canada. So it describes the physical functions of inverters for solar, for battery controllers, electric vehicle chargers, electric vehicles themselves are, are all governed by the standard. And uh, new for this rendition of the 1547 standard, data communication was included. So SunSpec Modbus is one of the standards that's used for local plant control that was included as part of that standard. And IEEE 2030.5 is another standard, which is used for system to uh, grid operator control. That's built into it. And so my point in mentioning this is that Orange Button comes from that same sort of tradition and where we've really done our, our level best uh, to maintain the, the consistency of meaning uh, for, from these terms, whether it's to enable equipment to talk to other equipment or for a system to talk to the grid or for one application like Bodhi to talk to solar success or anything else that we might imagine. And so, yeah, thank you very much for, uh, uh, for letting me participate here. We really appreciate it. And uh, uh, while well, you'll learn more about SunSpec, but it's all about uh, harnessing the collective energy of the marketplace and then uh, deploying it in, a, in an interesting way to drive down these soft costs and increase that innovation. So Tom, you guys host the AHJ registry. We do. And uh, I'm, I'm about to uh, tell you a little bit about the AHJ registry. Uh, I'm gonna be a little bit repetitive here though, because AHJ registry is all based in orange button principles. And so uh, the, the, the idea of the AHJ registry, of course, is in some ways it just represents low hanging fruit in, in terms of if you have a uniform taxonomy, what jobs could you put that taxonomy to work with that would uh, relieve the, the most pain in the industry all at once? And finding your local jurisdiction that will allow you to install your solar project turns out to be uh, meeting that criteria of low-hanging fruit very well. And so to reiterate what Jan mentioned earlier, the soft costs of solar are, are tremendous and they remain stubbornly high in the United States. And so Orange Button addresses uh, that, that, that pain directly. So with that said, uh, now how do we put it into play? So the AHJ registry takes this concept of, of uniform terms, units of measure and the like, and it and marries it with some other technologies, specifically the one that allows us to draw polygons around the boundaries for an authority having jurisdiction, such that uh, taking this, you know, in terms of what does AHA registry do from a consumer perspective, it's a website, it's got a big Google map on it. So you go to that website, you type in an address, and then hit the return button. And then what happens is it geolocates that address on the map and then draws a uh, boundaries around what authority having jurisdiction is responsible for decisions for that address. So you don't have to have pros that know everything about the jurisdiction through all time. You could actually take someone off the street and have them assign the correct AHJ. All you need project. to know is, is the address of the customer and, and the, the system will tell you the rest. Now, uh, that is, I would say that's generally the true. Sometimes things can change, right? Authorities of having jurisdiction can go away. They can be consolidated. New ones can pop up. And uh, also the uh, underlying uh, rules that they are governed by, what, what uh, building codes and the like can change. So we also enable the, those authorities having jurisdiction to edit their own entries so that they can tell us uh, what, what the state of play is there. So, but in summary, for the consumer, it's a website where you put in your address and find out wh who, who governs you. For the large scale developer, there's API access, such that if a uh, Solar Success or one of these other apps uh, wants to pull in the data directly, you can do it through an API call. And then, as I mentioned, the, the crowdsourcing, the community sourcing, right? You know, it turns out it, it, it's in everybody's interest to get this information out there. Right, AHJs are, are strapped for labor. They want to process more, process more applications. 
but they can't because they spend all their time on the phone answering questions about uh, what code standard are you complying to right now. So AHA registry takes care of, uh, of all of those, those types of pains. So, so in, this, in terms of, go, go ahead, Jen, sorry. Well, one of the things that I hadn't realized is that um, how much time is being saved by the AHJs because they need sure. to scale up as well to be able to support this 100% year sure. over year growth. Yeah, I mean, anybody that's in the building trades knows that, that the typical AHJ, they outsource their, their labor for plan checking and stuff like that. And uh, so you have inconsistency even about who you're dealing with. And so if you layer on top of that uh, incoming inquiries to ask about, oh, what, what's required to apply for a permit in your jurisdiction and how are you going to judge me? Yeah, that, that chews up a ton of time, right? So we can just eliminate that whole, that whole block, that whole function from the authority having jurisdiction by having accurate data that's represented in a uniform way that's presented to, then to the public and that's been able to be cross-checked because you have the community actually weighing in to see if the information is accurate. And I can see that you've got more um, of the building codes defined in the Sunbelt. So I guess where there's more solar, there's more data from the community, right? Well, that, that's right. Yeah, I mean, the distribution of solar across the United States is uneven. I wish it were more even, but it's not. It's concentrated you know, principally in about 30 some states. Uh, tools like these will allow solar to go many other places, right? Because for, for a given community going up that learning curve about what does it take to develop a, a renewable energy and a solar culture and su such that they can support the, the, the building trades and that, that type of business, well, it, it just it takes some practice here. So uh, so we are solving for sort of the long tail problem by leveraging the, the best practices uh, from those jurisdictions that have the most experience and understand the pitfalls of the, the best, solving those problems and then offering it up uh, to the rest of the country. And so as you can see here uh, in this uh, chart, which is a, it's an eye chart, but what, what we're intending to show here is how many different authorities having jurisdiction uh, exist, it, both in the database and in, exist in the United States, right? So this is, it seems like a, a head scratch of a problem. Really, you have to find out who the building department is. Turns out in the solar business, that's a hard question. And, uh, and, and specifically because the expectations uh, for automation and quick turnaround time and so forth, and where the selling is disconnected from the installing, uh, this is where that, that gap exists. So we seek to, to solve a, or answer a few common problems. What are the building codes, electrical codes, fire codes, wind codes, what have you? And so uh, it, most importantly, we define that or answer that question, what is the boundary for our given jurisdiction? And, and that really is the magic here. So now there's other data that people would want uh, and that's possible to add it in, but these, these are the basics that we cover every time. Thank you so much, Tom. This is a great service. And who would have known when you started the process that this is where it would have led in terms of what it took to actually make it work? Absolutely. I, I, I just wanted to, to uh, add one, one thing in closing here is that these, uh, these projects, they seem like almost magic how they spring up, but it's really deliberate. It's about stepwise, uh, the grinding away that's taken place in all these committee meetings that nobody wants to attend, but we do it anyway. It comes out in these reference applications that really capture the imagination and that could be subsumed into things like solar app that bring it all together. But we are at an inflection point and the, the really the most important aspect of having this capability is it will allow us to go uh, straight up in that hockey stick of growth. So th thanks again for allowing me to participate. Oh, so glad to have you, Tom. Thank you. And Dixon I, is is our um, last presenter here, and he's going to really talk about what it takes to reduce the risks for funding solar projects. And we've got a specific project in mind with the Nevada School District, and Dixon's going to speak about, about risk mitigation and how we can bring in this private funding. You got it. Thank you, Jen. So uh, let me get back here. To my slide. So uh, 
the earlier speakers, they all talked about creating the digital resources from the DOE orange button, the HJ registry to the DOE solar app. Data that was once fragmented and inconsistent now has structure and definition that can be leveraged across the ecosystem and support a business case, which is where I have been focused, the business case for data interoperability. I am with USI Insurance, the 10th largest insurance broker in the world. We provide insurance and surety services that rely heavily on data that currently comes to us from clients in many different forms, and we distribute to the insurance marketplace in many different forms. The business case for standardized data is clear. How to implement across industries is not. The work of the DOE, Enroll, and SunSpec has been instrumental in providing clarity for one part of the how. However, getting multi-industry stakeholder implementation remains a challenge. Given the size and complexity of USI, it's impossible to undertake dinner operability. So we have an innovation company, SRC Digital Insurance Services, that can operate outside of the corporate structure to experiment and explore ways to develop next generation products and services that USI can then incorporate. One area we're experimenting with is a digital ecosystem supported by blockchain and smart contracts. The objective of the digital ecosystem is to leverage the solar data app and orange button data interoperability to exchange data between project owners, the construction community, the supply chain, and the financial markets. The solar app ID, site ID creates a digital connection to each stakeholder, enabling systems to generate contracts Dixon, we might be losing you a little bit. So we've got the site ID connecting to, to so many different players that we could all actually know together exactly which site and project that we're working on. And we've also, this is the Nevada School District Master Plan. And I think we've lost Dixon. And if he could refresh his browser, that would be great. And I think we might just kind of move forward. So this is the Nevada Unified School District and their master plan for what they could afford to install solar, how they took the specifications, and they put it into a site object in order to establish the basis for a contract. Pulling together all of these different places using the orange button site object through each of these different services to complete all of the steps of a site as it matured and got delivered. And this data is available to all of these players in a consistent format, the amount of collaboration and financial risk that we can reduce is stunning. We fully expect new financial products to emerge based on this level of clarity. Very much thanks to Dixon's efforts there. So just to wrap up, we want to talk about, oops, Dixon, I think we might have missed how we're doing this, but just to wrap up in the interest of time, we want to talk about, we've got a couple different people hitting the buttons at the same time, talk about pulling this all together. So Orange Button came together um, from the Department of Energy, SunSpec, is instrumental in implementing how this worked, and we've got the working group. We knew that we would have to do taxonomy definitions, and we have found that the JSON site object is the core object that we're using in 80% in of the use cases. The AHJ object has also gotten great use, and we're expecting that the monthly operating report is going to um, further serve the utility scale operations, which we expect to be scaling rapidly in, to pull in the private funding that is sitting out on the sides. Someone told me there's $16 trillion available. If we can de-risk how that money gets spent and how we can show how we're you know, applying it appropriately. We didn't know that we could or should develop reference data sets for the entire industry to use, but with this insight, we have developed the AHJ registry and then the product code registry, which is gonna help us define what we need for solar app and permitting, and also just keep all of our inventory and specifications and warranties and all this information together. It is going to be fabulous as we 
move forward collectively helping everybody maintain this data. Same way every time, no more master electricians required for things. So this data harmonization and then integrating and talking amongst each other is gonna help us automate, which is gonna give us scalability. We are going to have higher productivity. The number of projects that each employee is going to be able to effectively work on and with greater quality is gonna go up. Our general productivity is gonna go up. So the question is, are we gonna fire those employees? The answer of course is no, because we're, we're gonna use them to give us more bandwidth to handle more projects at this improved quality level. Because we're handling more projects and we've got the consistent data, we are effectively de-risking the market. So we're gonna bring in more financing and more financial products that is going to further increase the bandwidth. All of this means that we are going to have more volume of solar installed, which is what we want for the planet. And for every single business owner, it means you're gonna have higher profits because you're gonna be able to do more jobs more quickly. So this is the key to harmonize the data and then the benefits that it's going to iteratively deliver for all of the players across the ecosystem. So it is time. We need to migrate from the siloed systems into a fully, app, fully integrated application suite. Solar Success is addressing each of these and includes third-party integrations for specialty software in each of these different areas. Please notice that the orange button software is expanding. We've got gettheferral.com, Enerflow and SolarBlaze are, are building orange button compliant APIs. These guys are all using the site object. Soligo is also transferring the site object. Bodhi is using the site object. And the AHJ registry is using the AHJ object. And this list is expected to grow and grow. So this is the time to plug in so that you can build it once and reuse it often and add another you know, piece to your puzzle of your specialty software, just like your electronic equipment, just by plugging it into this lot, the socket. We're gonna make it easy to plug into these specialty softwares. And early adopters have experienced exponential growth. So, the, so in 2019, we had number two, five, and 10 on solar success. In 2020, they were one, three, and five. And in 2021, they are number one, two, and three. So the solar installers on solar success with an integrated harmonized database are growing faster than every other solar installer. This trend is only going to continue because the quantity of data involved becomes overwhelming and unworkable relatively quickly with 100% year over year growth, double hyper growth. So just some closing thoughts since I've got some small children. So we're gonna talk about Chai the elephant, Phil the ostrich and Gracie the giraffe to pull all of these points home. First, we need to acknowledge the elephant in the room. Data standardization, harmonization, integration, automation, these are critical for growth. The 30% savings to reduce the price of solar installations is more than the hardware. This has to get addressed. We have to do this together and we just need to acknowledge that it's a lot of work, but we need to acknowledge that this is what's necessary to grow and scale. If you ignore the new apps by sticking your head in the sand and pretending that it's, it's okay not to worry about this data thing, you are absolutely gonna limit your scalability. It is not necessarily fun to untangle the hair, hair ball over here, but it is absolutely fun to grow at scale. So the time is now, don't pretend that the future is gonna get any easier. And last, you know, Gracie the giraffe, can reach up and it benefits from the early adoption and the hyper growth that we know is coming so that you can take advantage and benefit from the wave that is lifting all boats that we are going to experience in the future. So please be like Gracie. Um, thank you very much for, for everyone attending. 
and hearing about all of these exciting, to me, super exciting opportunities that are coming together to make this work. Kelly, do we have any questions or anything from the audience? Actually, to keep this all uh, within our hour, we uh, are going to wrap this up a, a little early. But uh, again, this this webinar will be sent to all registrants. So if you do come up with a few questions that you uh, want to ask our presenters for, um, you will be able to do that. Um, so I'd like to thank Jan and, and Blue Banyan and everyone for uh, participating on this webinar and pulling everything together. It was a really great conversation. And I hope everybody enjoyed it. So please join us for more Solar Power World webinars in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you for attending. Thank you.